going ahead with this program. And without further ado, Wendy, I turn it over to you. Okay. Um, so the first thing that I'm showing you is that we have a baby, and that baby was culture positive with tuberculosis. So there was a contact investigation, a source case contact investigation around that baby, and that investigation identified a babysitter with a TB who had been infectious for quite some time, and also a toddler with culture positive TB. And all this occurred before genotyping results. After genotyping, we um, found that the three cases, initial cases, the baby, the toddler, and the babysitter all had the same isolate genotype. But there was another case with the same isolate genotype who turned out to be an assistant minister. And when we talked to him, it turned out that um, the babysitter was also a church deacon in the same church and had transmitted TB to that minister. The contact investigation around the assistant minister identified another minister, but it also identified that our um, babysitter church deacon had actually been the person who infected the second minister. So this is mixing up contact investigations and genotyping information. So can we go to the next slide? After genotyping, it turned out uh, that there was another case who had the same genotype, and that case was a hotel chef. And investigation of that um, hotel chef uh, revealed that our babysitter was also an assistant cook. Next slide. So this slide shows the combination of people in this small outbreak that we had that was caused by a highly infectious source case. The blue arrows um, identify the transmission that occurred and was identified through contact investigation. But the red arrows were all uh, demonstrating transmission from the babysitter, also a church deacon and assistant cook, to ministers in his church and also a hotel chef where he worked. So we now have three settings, the babysitting setting, the church, and the hotel kitchen. And two of those settings were only identified after genotyping occurred. So I wanted to just use this to whet your appetite. And now I'll turn the presentation over to Lauren to describe exactly what geno TB genotyping is and how it's done. Good morning. Please let me also extend my appreciation for your attendance today. I hope that Wendy has piqued your interest in learning more about genotyping. I know that she has many more fascinating examples to share with you later in the presentation. But first she wanted me to take a few minutes to provide you with an overview of genotyping. So, so we'll start at the beginning. Why do we genotype Mycobacterium tuberculosis? Well, we use genotyping to compare isolates and to answer the question, are they the same or are they different? Now, this is a relatively simple direct question and one that small children enjoy answering. Are these two pictures the same or are they different? In this example, the picture shows a dog or a cat, and so we conclude that the pictures are different. In the second example, the pictures contain the same elements, and so we conclude that the pictures are the same. We use genotyping in the same manner to create a picture, if you will, of the Mycobacterium tuberculosis genome. And then we compare these pictures to determine if the two strains are the same or different. So hopefully now you understand the basics of genotyping. And we need to explore two assumptions that we make while we are interpreting these genotype pictures. Our first assumption is that there are so many different strains of Mycobacterium tuberculosis circulating in a community that the best explanation for two patients being infected with the same strain is that the two patients share some type of relationship. The diversity of strains circulating in the United States is quite high. Through the activities of the National TB Genotyping Service, we have detected more than 13,000 different strains and identify new ones daily. In this picture, I reflect the strain diversity in a community using colors. Notice that only two patients, I don't think my animation is quite working. Um, have the same color pink genotype strain. 
our assumption would be, ah, there it is. Our assumption would be that the best explanation for these two patients being infected with the pink bacteria is that there must be some type of relationship between these two patients. This relationship could be as simple as direct transmission shown here or more complex as Wendy will demonstrate later. The relationship could be relatively recent or quite, quite long ago. The diversity of TB strains in, um, in the United States reflects the diversity of its TB cases. In a community such as the Philippines where the introduction of new strains is limited, the diversity of TB strains can be much lower. This decreased diversity greatly limits the ability to infer relationships between parents, patients. Our second assumption is that the genotyping method being used characterizes regions of the genome that change frequently enough to create diversity, but not so frequently that it changes during a chain of transmission. For example, if the genome changed so rapidly that it changed from pink to blue to yellow to green while being transmitted, I admit this is somewhat a ridiculous example, but it proves its point. We would not be able to use genotyping to infer any type of relationship. Likewise, if the genome never changed, we would have no strain diversity and, again, no ability to use genotyping to infer relationships. Our picture of the genome needs to include elements that change not too slow and not too fast, but at just the right rate. To create our pictures of the TB genome, we use two or three different genotyping methods to characterize small segments of the TB genome. Our picture is very incomplete as these segments encompass only 1% of the complete genome. I'll introduce these three methods to you in a moment, but first let me answer the question of why we use multiple methods. Do you remember our pictures from the beginning? Each had three elements, a building, a tree, and a pet. If we only compared our pictures based on two elements, we might conclude that the pictures are the same, when in reality, they are different. We use multiple genotyping methods to provide as much information as possible. All elements equally make the pictures different. It doesn't matter if the pictures contain both the same dog or the same dog and house or the same house and tree. If any element is different, then the pictures are different. Likewise, if two strains have the same Miravian TR pattern and different spologotypes, they are different. And if they have the same spologotypes and different Miravian TR patterns, they are still different. And even though we use multiple methods to increase the information presented in our pictures of the genome, in the end, we are really only looking at 1% of the picture. Sometimes that small picture will provide you with sufficient evidence to conclude that the two strains are different. But other times, the pictures can appear the same when in reality, they are different. Matching pictures can be used as evidence to support the existence of a relationship, but never to prove that relationship. In genotyping, it's important to remember that it's always easier to demonstrate that two strains are different than it is to show that two strains are the same. So now let's turn to our methods. Spologotyping examines the variation found at a single locus or location in the genome. This direct repeat locus contains 36 base pair directly repeated sequences separated by short spacer DNA sequences. The assay is designed to detect the presence or absence of 43 of these short spacers. Here we have the 43 spacers in a line with black boxes indicating that the spacer is present in the strain and empty spaces indicating that the spacer is absent. We create a 43-digit binary result for the spologotype by indicating the presence of a spacer with a 1 and the absence with a 0. Now, if you have seen a spologotype in a genotype report, you know that it doesn't contain any 43-digit binary results, and you are correct. 
To make this phthalogotype result more compact, we report the octal designation for this number, and that results in the 15-digit results that is contained on your genotype reports. An important thing to note here is that these are actual results and not a type designation name. MIRI VNTR typing differs from phthalogotyping in that it examines variation found in multiple loci or locations distributed throughout the genome. These loci contain tandemly repeated DNA elements, and the number of those repeated elements differ from strain to strain. We analyze each of these loci individually to determine the number of tandem repeats present, and then concatenate these results into a string to generate the MIRI results. To keep the strings at 12 characters, we use the convention that an A is 10 copies, B for 11 copies, and so forth. A dash in the results indicates that no result was obtained for that locus. When the National TB Genotyping Service was launched in 2004, we characterized 12 MIRI VNTR loci. In 2009, we expanded that assay to provide even more information to include an additional 12 VNTR loci. The original 12 we report to you as MIRI 1, and the new 12 are reported as MIRI 2. Spoligotyping and MIRI VNTR typing are routinely performed on all isolates submitted for genotyping to the National TB Genotyping Service. A third method that is available upon request is IS6110 RSLP fingerprinting. This assay is based on the variation found between strains in both the number of copies of IS6110 and their positions in the genome. Unlike the digital results generated by spoligotyping and MIRI VNTR, IS6110 results are pictorial and thus more difficult to report and compare. IS6110 fingerprints are named as they are identified. This method can be used to add additional information to the picture of the genome. Now you have a chance to be involved. Let's look at some genotyping results. Do you think that these results suggest that there is a relationship between these two patients? I'll give you a chance to look at the picture, and then we'll move on. And here is where you can answer. And it looks like 94% of the people say false, and they're correct. These results are completely different, and that would suggest that there is no relationship between the two patients with these isolates. A second example, let's look at these genotype results. Could there be a relationship between these two patients? And overwhelmingly, everybody thinks it's true. And yes, the results are the same, and there very well may be a relationship between these two patients. Looking at the same results that we just looked at, do they prove that there is a relationship between these two patients? And the result is not quite <coughs> clear cut, but no, the results are consistent with the conclusion that there is a relationship, but they do not prove that conclusion. Now let's look at two very similar genotyping results. Notice that they are nearly identical and differ only at one locus from the MIRI-1 results. Do you think these results suggest that there may be a relationship between these two patients?
Again, not quite as clear cut an answer. And I have to apologize for this because it was kind of a trick question. An analogy with our pictures would be that the apple tree lost one of its apples. We really don't know when the apple fell off the tree. It could have been yesterday or forever ago. In genotyping, we call these really, really closely related genotypes one-offs. We don't use these one-off results to conclude that the strains are different or the same. Both answers are correct. The change could have happened long ago, and there is no relationship between these two patients. And the change could have happened more recently, and there could be a relationship between these two patients. In other words, these genotype results are consistent with both answers. So everybody got it right. Our last example is the genotype result of genotype G contains a dash indicating no result was obtained for that locus. But it matches that of isolate H in all other regards. Do these results suggest that the isolates are different? It looks like everyone's voted. That's right. The answer is false. There is no data here that can be used to show that the isolates are different. Finally, let me introduce you to some of the nomenclature we use for TB genotyping. First of all, as each combination of spoligotype and MIRI-1 pattern is identified at the national level, it receives a PCR type name. Next, as two PCR types are identified within a state, it receives a state cluster name. PCR types are comparable between states. State cluster names are not. These naming conventions were put into place prior to the expansion of MIRI VNTR to 24 loci. To incorporate the new results into the state cluster name, as two isolates within a state have the same spoligotype, MIRU1 and MIRU2 results, as soon as that is identified, a state cluster name 2 is defined. These state cluster name 2 subcluster within the original state clusters to provide you with continuity with results obtained prior to 2009. The National TB Genotyping Service is funded by CDC and provides for the genotyping of one isolate from every culture-positive TB case in the United States. Since 2003, over 70,000 isolates have been genotyped. I cannot take the credit for this enormous undertaking and would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the work done by the genotyping labs located at the Michigan Department of Community Health and the California Department of Health Services. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have at the end of the presentation, but now I'm going to hand the microphone back over to Wendy to present how genotyping can be used in programmatic activities. So I'm going to give you uh, my presentation objectives about the application of genotyping. Well, so sure. Um, okay, one is to interpret the meaning of a genotyping cluster. The next is to describe six ways that TB genotyping can be applied to local programs. The next is to describe steps to conduct a cluster investigation and to describe how genotyping can be used to evaluate and improve local TB control activities. So I have a question for you. Does genotype clustering of isolates from different patients indicate recent transmission has occurred? Well, we got a nice mix of answers here. And the, and the answer is yes, sometimes. Um, it indicates that recent transmission may have occurred, but you need more information in the field to understand that answer. Why is genotyping so important to us? 
Genotyping helps us in a, in a number of ways in our local programs. One is to identify and interrupt recent transmission to prevent outbreaks or to uh, slow down outbreaks or stop outbreaks earlier than they would have stopped if they'd been allowed to continue without intervention. It helps us to identify unsuspected relationships and it enhances contact investigations because we identify previously unidentified source cases as I showed you uh, with the babysitter um, and the church and the babysitter and the hotel restaurant and helps us identify previously unidentified locations. You can use genotyping to distinguish relapse from new infection of a person. You can recognize false positives and you can monitor trends and evaluate TB program performance. So a genotype cluster, as Lauren said, is when an isolate genotype matches at least one other person's isolate genotype. And in this example, you can see that the spallator types and the uh, 24 loci for Miro match identically. So what does the cluster mean? Does the isolate match at least one other isolate in the database? The answer is yes. Um, it depends on your database, however. You might be looking at a state database, a large metropolitan area database, or a national database. And it may indicate recent transmission, but not necessarily, and we will talk about that in a minute. If the isolate doesn't match another isolate in the database, we call this unique. And this could mean a number of things. It could indicate reactivation of an old infection. Um, if someone got infected many years ago, the organism uh, may have changed enough that uh, we, we, we identify a unique isolate with their past infection, but not with recent uh, TB infection. It may indicate in, imported TB, which means uh, TB came from people that came into the country. They were infected in their country of origin, and they brought their organism in with them. But unique can also result from missing isolates. So if 60% um, of the isolates from your culture positive patients have been genotyped, and you have a unique pattern for a patient, you don't know whether there might have been a cluster with one of the 40% of isolates that weren't submitted for genotyping. So it's really important to have high proportions of isolates submitted for genotyping. I believe now the national proportion is over 80%, and certainly if you can get up to 85, 90, or 95%, you have good clustering data. So if two cases are clustered genotypically, is there true evidence of ongoing transmission? Well, the genotype laboratory information that Lauren so eloquently described is only half the picture. To determine whether recent transmission actually occurred, both genotyping and epidemiologic information is needed. And this is what George Comstock used to call shoe leather epidemiology. And in that case, we use epidemiologic links, or what's commonly known as an epi link, which is an identified relationship between TB patients. So in this case, we have a small child who goes to daycare who has active TB and a positive culture. And that child's isolate matches the isolate from the daycare teacher. So probably this link might have been found out through contact investigation. Uh, because the child investigation, the, the source case investigation around the child might have been conducted. But it turns out in our database that there's this very dashing, debonair young bartender who also matches the other two patients, but we have no link, nothing was identified during contact investigation. When we went back and talked to that debonair bartender, it turns out that he dated um, the teacher at the daycare center for a short time during her infectious period, but because that was some time in the past, she had forgotten to mention it when she was being interviewed for her contact investigation. So epi links are essential for determining ongoing transmission. And to get at them, we want to know personal characteristics such as demographics and risk, homelessness or uh, substance abuse. We want to know the place where the people were, were they located um, at a place where they spent time together. And these could be bars, jails, homeless shelters, churches. Um, they could be in the same apartment building, or they could maybe play cards together or hang out together, or they could be, of course, in a household, work, or school. And we also need time. Were they together at the time that one of the two patients was infectious? I want to give you a tale of two investigations. 
um, a contact investigation differs from a cluster investigation in that a contact investigation centers around one TB case or suspect. A cluster investigation takes place after genotyping information has been received from the genotyping lab, lab and it involves two or more cases that have the same genotype and are therefore in a cluster. The contact investigation uh, is centered around named contacts. A cluster investigation is centered around finding epilinks between cases that have the same um, isolate genotype. Contact investigation is occur occurs when the infectious case or suspect is identified. The, co the cluster investigation doesn't occur until after the report's received. Contact investigations generally take place in households and they may spread to workplace, schools, or congregate settings. The cluster investigations also identify unusual settings like bars, religious gatherings, card games, and other settings that might not be picked up in a routine contact investigation. Contact investigations um, depend on interviewing the case and suspect, doing record reviews, and sometimes site visits. And cluster investigations are similar in that you review the genotyping data first, but then you interview the case manager to find out what they know about the, the um, case or suspect or the two cases that have, this, they're not case suspects, the two cases that have the same patterns. We also um, review contact investigation records and case medical records because sometimes even if the cases didn't know they were in the same place, perhaps they were in a hospital at the same time, this might be mentioned in their medical record. And then we go out and re-interview those cases if we can't find a link any other way to identify whether they knew each other or spent time in the same place. And we also conduct site visits in cluster investigations. The purpose of a contact investigation is to identify patients with latent TB infection or newly identified patients with TB. And of course the purpose is to prevent new cases of active TB. Contact cluster investigations are very similar. Um, we also want to identify new cases with infection or TB and prevent new active TB. One of the ways we do this is we make a decision about whether we need to expand the contact investigation. If we had expanded the contact in investigation around uh, the babysitter that I described in the um, introduction, we may have discovered that that person also uh, was an active member of a church and worked in a hotel kitchen. And we may have identified those links. So um, these are data from Maryland about the proportion of epi links that were de detected by routine contact investigation and the epi links that were detected only after contact investigation and genotyping results were received. So about two-thirds of epi links were identified through routine contact investigation, but 37 percent, almost 40 percent of the links were only identified after we investigated when we got the genotyping information back. So I'd like to ask you, what locations do you think the routine contact investigation missed? This is kind of fun to watch. Um, those of you that voted for social settings were correct. Um, households, it's possible they could miss a household. So uh, the, the people who voted for household, school, and workplace, certainly contact investigations can miss those places. But the, the place that genotyping has really identified are social settings that we need to ask more about where people spend their time outside of household, schools, and workplaces. And so this is what we've discovered and what we're working on try, to try to improve the way contact investigations are conducted. To identify epilinks, um, as I said before, we talk to the health department, we, ident we talk to the case manager for the cases who were in the cluster to find out if they already knew about a link, and then if they do, then we document that and we don't do any more on the cluster investigation. If the case managers don't know, um, we like to look in the medical records and the contact investigation logs, maybe one of them named each other in a contact investigation, um, maybe a place was common in the medical records. And um, we try not to interview patients again if possible, but um, we do this if necessary because we want to understand what's happening with transmission. That's the only way that we can actually uh, intervene. 
So what do we look for? Did one case name the other as a contact? Did the cases name the same contact? Maybe there's a common person in between that suggests a relationship between our two cases. Do they live, work, or spend time in the same place? Um, the infectious period is very important. And if they're foreign born, we want to know what the country of origin is. Was the other person in the cluster um, from their same country? Do they socialize together? Did they both bring that organism in from their country of origin? And when did the people arrive in the United States? If the second case in the cluster arrives right before diagnosis, it's unlikely that they were infected by the first person in the cluster because they wouldn't have been in the country long enough. They probably were already um, infected and had active di disease at the time they arrived. So these are all things we try to do to understand what really happened. So this is another outbreak I want to go through briefly. The diagonal lines were um, patients that were linked only through genotyping, and the solid circles are um, patients who were identified through genotyping and um, also through contact investigation. So we have a worker one. This worker um, had a person who came and worked on her house, and so the painter wasn't identified because normally you don't think of a painter who paints the outside of your house as being a person who's likely to transmit TB. But it turned out once we investigated these two that the, there was a relationship between the worker and the painter, and the painter spent quite a bit of time inside the house as well as outside. And we also knew that this worker had infected several other workers in the same workplace, which turned out to be a fishery house. What we didn't know was the worker one was also a cook in a restaurant, or she was a waitress in a wet restaurant, and a cook in that restaurant also became infected. This was identified after genotyping. Another worker who worked in another fishery in the same area was identified through genotyping, and it turned out that that worker drank a lot with worker number two. Worker number three had a girlfriend who was infected, and another person was identified, and it turned out that that person rode in the same car every Sunday to church with a girlfriend. And then we also identified a brother who was in daycare. Fortunately, there was no more spread in that daycare, and a grandchild. And we had a 12th case who we never were able to link back to the cluster, but we're quite certain because this was the only person without a link that uh, something happened somewhere in this cluster, but we were just unidentified, unable to identify that relationship. So epi links are commonly divided into known links, possible links, and no identified links. And sometimes uh, with known, we also talk about probable links. So a known link is when patients name each other, uh, perhaps as contacts or during the cluster investigation, or they were in the same place at the same time, which could be a homeless shelter, um, it could be a church. A possible link is when patients spend time in the same place around the same time, but we couldn't get the overlapping time, overlap of time proven. Sometimes this happens if they're in the same neighborhood, but we couldn't actually prove that they were spending time together, or they were in the same homeless shelter, but the dates weren't really clear. And um, it could also be a geographic area. We also talk about uh, recently nearest neighbor and GIS analysis. What if they just live in an area really close to another person? Or if they share social and behavioral traits at the same time that they were in that area, like substance abuse um, or homelessness. All these things increase the likelihood that a link exists. We don't, never say that there's no link. We always say there was no identified link because it may just be that somebody doesn't know the name of another person or they're not willing to talk about relationships that they have. So we're never sure whether there's not a link, but we, we know sometimes we can't identify a link. The next thing that's really important is to uh, understand what happened in transmission. So we want to determine the probable source and secondary cases. And if you work by the date of diagnosis, the cluster looks like it falls out this way. Patient number one infected patient number two. Patient number two infected patients three and four. But if we work from the time of symptom onset, which is not something that we collect nationally um, for good reason, it's, it's not a very reliable date. But if we find out and talk to a patient about when they actually started coughing or when they showed symptoms, we may get another picture. And in this case, it turned out that patient number two was the source for patients one, three, and four. 
And in our large outbreaks, it usually works out this way. Uh, the, index, the, the index patient, who is patient number one, is different from the source patient. The source patient may have been infectious um, sometimes we found for six months or even a year. They're coughing. They keep going to emergency rooms. TB is not diagnosed. Meanwhile, their secondary cases are already being identified before the source case is actually identified and diagnosed as a TB case. So watch out for this kind of scenario, especially when you have outbreaks that involve five or more people. So the definition of an infectious period is the time when a person is capable of transmitting t t TB to others who share, share the same airspace. And it's usually estimated by the patient reported date of onset, if you can get that. And of course, a patient to transmit is 99.999% of the time uh, pulmonary. So this is uh, adapted from the CDC chart on estimating the infectious period for contact investigations. In our case, uh, the patients need to be sputum culture positive. Um, they don't have to be smear positive. We know that 20% of transmission occurs from smear negative people who are sputum culture positive. They may or may not have symptoms. They may or may not be cavitary, although um, these are all indicators of level of severity of disease and perhaps increased infectiousness. And so we say the beginning of the infectious period is three months before symptom onset or the first uh, positive finding consistent with TB, which could be the chest X-ray date, the date the sputum was collected for smear, the date it was collected for culture, whichever is longer. So I have another question for you. Uh, MTB genotyping has enhanced TB contact investigations by demonstrating what? Very good. Um, contact investigation interviews need to question about social settings and locations. And we're working on creating a form that will do just that that may enhance contact investigations. So in summary, recent transmission is a search for commonalities. We look for information common in the cases, demographics, and risk factors. Um, we look at infectious periods. We want to know work and school histories. Social history is very important. Travel history could be important. History of TB exposures. Um, somebody might have broken down from TB from an exposure long ago. Uh, just because they're in a cluster doesn't necessarily mean they had recent transmission. We always want to look at contact lists. And of course, location, location, location is essential for these investigations. The next thing I want to talk is relapse or exogenous reinfection. Now, this is, this is a, a fake homeless person. Um, but given the idea that we had a homeless outbreak in Baltimore that was well known by a particular pattern, uh, we had this new person show up, Rodney Holmes, who's homeless. And so we all say, yeah, he's going to be part of that homeless um, outbreak that we've been dealing with. But when we got the genotype results back on Rodney Holmes, it turned out that the spirogotype and Miru were different, and he was in a different cluster. And so that led us to go back and look at prior genotyping data. And it turned out that four years earlier, we had an isolated genotype from Rodney Holmes, and he had the same pattern. And so this told us that he was not infected by the uh, homeless outbreak strain, but in fact, he had relapse of his earlier infection. And we do see this in, um, in the states. Most, the time, most of the time when a patient has TB a second time, it's actually due to relapse. Um, in developing countries where there's a high prevalence of TB and lots of likelihood of exposure, um, it's just as likely that the person was infected by a new organism um, as that they had relapse of an organism which they already had. Next, I want to talk about false positive cultures. So what happens with a false positive culture? Whoops, I'm too fast. Um, usually, something will happen in the laboratory where two test tubes touch each other. There's some aerosolization, often invisible, that occurs um, so that the organism spreads. Or sometimes there's a spill. Often, when we investigate false positive cultures, 
Uh, we find it very hard to identify the exact instant that that contamination occurred. The way that we look at false positive cultures in Maryland is we sort our data first by cluster whenever we get new data, and then by specimen collection date. And we look for specimen collection dates that are really within a week, plus or minus a week of each other. So in this scenario, and this is not the year 2010, it's actually 2010, um, we find that these specimens were collected at very similar dates, and they're in the same cluster. And that triggers us to look and see where were those organisms collected. Were they collected in the same hospital? Um, were they processed in the same lab? because these are clues that one of these two might be false positive. It's not impossible that transmission occurred if one case had been infection, infected for a long time before the specimen was collected, but um, it's a high likelihood that something might be happening and this warrants an investigation. And if you look at the second cluster, Maryland 10, you'll see that the time of specimen collection was distribu distributed over time, and that's much more likely to suggest that transmission may have occurred. So are false positive cultures due to which of these methods? The answer is actually all of the above. Certainly cross-contamination in the laboratory is the most common reason for false positive cultures, but Bronchoscopes can also become contaminated, be used on one person and become contaminated, and then that organism is transmitted to another person when the scope is used. That person doesn't come down with active TB, but when their um, bronch washing is collected and processed and cultured, it actually can grow up the organism from the scope. And we have mislabeling um, periodically in Maryland. We had one episode where um, a patient was in the hospital, and on a weekend, a doctor who wasn't her regular doctor came into the room and said, Ms. Jones, I'm very sorry to tell you that your sputum culture was positive for tuberculosis, and we're going to have to treat you for tuberculosis. And in this case, we were really lucky because Ms. Jones wasn't confused or too sleepy to think, and she said, nobody ever collected a sputum from me. And it turned out the sputum was collected from the patient in the room next door. Sometimes there can be mislabeling of a, of a specimen in a laboratory when they process the specimen. We've had at least three of these, and usually they're uh, suspected by a lab or by a hospital. It's very hard to identify from a central perspective. So causes, we've gone through this. The consequences are fairly serious. Uh, the patient gets an incorrect TB diagnosis. They get unnecessary, toxic, anti-TB treatment. And sometimes, in our case, we've had patients that have been treated for an entire disease for six months before it's determined that they had a false positive culture. There are delays in diagnosing um, what's actually happening with the patient, which may allow that uh, condition to get more severe. And although false positive cultures account for somewhere between 1% and 5%, of positive cultures, it's also possible to overestimate the TB case rate, and so these are concerns. But the first concerns are actually urgent, and we try to jump on anything that we suspect is a false positive culture immediately in our program. And then finally, I just want to review quickly how we can use um, TB genotyping for program evaluation. We can track recent TB transmission over time by looking at the number of new patients in a large cluster looking at the total number of new clustered patients or the proportions of new clustered patients and the total number of new clusters. If we see a new genotype in our program area and two people have that organism and we haven't seen it before, um, it's highly likely that transmission occur occurred between those two people, which we only can know once we investigate that cluster. So this is just shows you a large outbreak. We had a transgender outbreak that actually occurred in, in other states in the East Coast as well as Baltimore. But you can see that the sort of epicenter of, of that, thinking of, uh, of the um, earthquake yesterday, the epicenter was uh, 2005. But in, in 2009, 10, and 11, we haven't seen any cases with that pattern. And so we know that that outbreak is over. 
And you can also look at our reduction of the new clustered cases or the proportions of new clustered cases over time. And that suggests that recent transmission is decreasing in our state and shows that the program is working. And I think that's the end of my presentation. David, I'm going to turn it over to you for questions. Wendy, I'm sorry about that. I just uh, <laughs> turned the mic. That was fantastic. Lauren, outstanding. I mean, uh, I really, really appreciated that, uh, both of your, uh, your presentations. And uh, what I'd like to do now is, if it's okay with the audience, is I'd like to first uh, go over how to ask questions, because I, I think we're going to have a lot of active discussions. I know I, I have a lot of questions I want to ask, um, but obviously uh, we want you guys to ask. Uh, so there's a couple different ways to do it. One is that you can email us, and if you look on your screen, uh, you have a way to uh, ask a question via the chat. Or the second way is please ask a question, which we really appreciate, over the phone. And, uh, in this, and what I'd like to do now is turn it over to the Global Crossing Operator who will explain how to ask a question over the phone. Thank you. To register a question via the telephone, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone keypad. You'll hear a three-tone prompt to acknowledge your request. If your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press 1-3. And then lastly, for our, our audience here at AG Holly, if you have a question, please just raise your hand and just uh, tell me and uh, we'll get a mic to you. So, uh, Wendy, I actually, I'm going to start with you if it's okay. I mean, uh, we've really been uh, using uh, genotyping more and more here in Florida, and we've had some uh, interesting cases. And the first thing I'd just like to comment on, Wendy, which I always get a little upset, is that, you know, you guys always bring up the whole idea of how we get cross-contamination through bronchoscopy. And you're always blaming it on the pulmonologist that we <laughs> caused the problems. I just want to emphasize that those studies were done by a bunch of infectious disease guys <laughs> health guys up in Maryland, if I'm correct, <laughs> No, we had transmission through a bronchoscope. That wasn't contamination. Uh, I'm sorry? We actually had transmission of TB from a bronchoscope. But, I, I, but see, you're always blaming, you're always blaming the <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot more transmission. I bet you probably, that bronchoscopy is not the number one mode of transmission of TB. That's just a guess of mine. <laughs> but, I think that might be true. <laughs> Actually, uh, you know, we we have a uh, we've had a recently a couple of really interesting cases that uh, genotyping has really helped us out. And you know, one of the big problems we have clinically all the time is with um, I don't want to say cross contamination, but let's say false positives. And uh, we recently had a, a very interesting case where uh, we had a patient who was uh, awaiting a heart transplant, actually and uh, was having very, very large uh, th uh, plural fl uh, fusions and had to have uh, the effusions tapped. And on one of the taps, which was AFB negative, it was a transudate, uh, what happened was is that suddenly uh, about two months after the plural fusion was tapped, a culture comes back as TB. And because of this positive culture, the transplant team would now no longer transplant this patient because, you know, obviously it would act as TB. And, uh, you know, the patient was sent to us at AG Holly to try to maximize meds. And in the course of trying to, you know, evaluate the patient, we realized that the clinical scenario just did not make sense. This patient was actually a school teacher and always had uh, PPDs done every year. Her PPDs were always negative. All of her quantity, you know, her eye grids were always negative. And uh, we came back and uh, we sure enough did a genotyping, and interestingly enough, he, she matched only one other person from the same area in Hillsborough, but there could be no epidemiologic link that we could find in that case other than something that was very interesting. The two patients were at different hospitals, but interestingly enough, the hospitals actually sent the specimens to the same lab. And I guess my question to you is that in the process, and then once we, we went back and looked, they were both processed at the same time. Interestingly enough, the other patient was always culture positive. And the only time that the patient ever had a negative culture was on the day that our patient had the positive culture. So we suspected that that was the day they switched specimens, uh, or, you know, uh, or they entered it differently. But I guess my question to you is something that we face here at, uh, in Florida is that we try to review our links, you know, and what this case taught us is that it's not, a, it's not that simple. You know, we try to look at the clustered cases and we try to screen them quickly. 
But I think you alluded to that sometimes these cases are very hard to pick up as a true uh, cross-contamination or false positive. And that even using labs, because we used to just look at if the, if the hot, where, where they were submitted from, and if the two hospitals were the same, we started to look closer. But in this case, what's making it more complex nowadays is more and more hospitals are not processing the specimens and sending it to a similar lab. But the results come back to the hospital. And I was wondering if you have any suggestions on, when you were looking at before, uh, ways to, you know, what you look at for to, to, you know, suggest clustering. Do you look at where the specimen came from, or more importantly, where the, which lab processed it? We do both. We, we look to see where it was collected. Um, we collect information on the originating lab for, this, for, the, um, for, the, for the specimen, actually, because sometimes what will happen is um, the, the specimen will be collected and maybe they do a direct smear at a hospital and then they send the specimen to the state lab for culture. And the contamination actually occurred at the hospital where they did the smear and not at the state lab, although certainly we have um, rare episodes of contamination in the state lab. I mean, some of the clues of false positives are that they take a long time to grow up, like the example that you discussed where it was eight weeks almost before you finally got the positive, because usually there are very few organisms in the culture. Um, so we go through both. To answer your question directly, we go through both. We like right. to look at the lab where it was processed and the place where it was collected. And we also, if we suspect that a false positive could have occurred, um, we try to talk with the provider to understand what the clinical picture is with that patient because um, we, we want that person to think about whether this could act, actually be TB or not. And sometimes, you know, with HIV patients, that's not an easy thing uh, to determine. And so you really need to be very careful about your investigation. And we've also had false positive cultures in patients who do have TB, but just that particular organism was not their organism. And we can test that if they had a prior organism or sometimes they become diagnosed as clinical TB because the provider just feels that it's, their symptoms are similar enough and they're afraid to stop treatment. I, I think you bring up a very, very interesting point. Uh, you know, and we do the same thing, which is when, when we start to suspect uh, the possibility of a cross-contamination or a false positive, whatever, you, you know, whatever you'd like to use, and each situation is a little different, uh, we usually look at if the person was consistently smear negative, because I think you'd agree that normally if the person's smear positive, it's less likely to be a cross-contamination, except in cases like this where you may have mislabeled it or you may have switched the specimen. And then, just like you said, that the clinical scenario just doesn't match. But one of the in interesting parts we found in this case, also that kind of complicated things, was that the clinicians who originally took care of the patient back in the hospital were not the clinicians who later on made the diagnosis. And that's another issue we're having is that there's a lack of, there's not the continuity of care that we would like. And I guess my comment on this whole thing is that often, I think it's an important message for all of us in public health, we're the ones, it's the TV, it's these TB clinics and the clinicians in the clinic that are going to have to go back and make that diagnosis because a lot of times the care is somewhat fragmented. And I think that's why genotyping is so important. And then, like you're bringing out, and I think both you and Lauren brought out very importantly, it's it's only one piece of the puzzle. I think we need the whole other end of going back clinically, making sure it's uh, appropriate. So thanks. Um, we have a question that came in from our, our, our email and says, uh, and I, I'll, I'll turn this over. If so, see, Lauren, I'm going to let you uh, answer this. It says, can we reveal names, identification, information during cluster investigations? And again, Lauren if, or Wendy, whichever, whoever wants to answer, please go ahead. Actually, Wendy, I think you'd probably be more appropriate for that. Okay. Um, that, that, that's a good question. Uh, we, we certainly in Maryland are not allowed to do that, and I think because of confidentiality, you, you really, really, really have to avoid giving a name up front. Um, you try to you try to get the patient to name another patient, and um, we also find that we don't name the settings. Um, for example, if there's a school where you believe transmission occurred between those two patients. You, you don't name the school. You, you try to get them to give you the name of a place to confirm that that uh, person might have been in that school or that, or that store. We had a store or a church. Um, 
sometimes if we're pretty sure there's a link and we just can't get it, we might, um, you know, give a list of names of workplaces and, and, the, and the name that where we think it might have occurred will be in that list because we know somebody was in a, um, oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe they were a security guard or something and they work somewhere and we just want to throw out the name of a bunch of security agencies to see whether we could get them work in, in the same, working in the same place. But they can't tell from that list which one we're really looking for. I know that in um, some parts of the country, I think New York City and I know Alabama has used this in the past, people have shown photo sheets of people, including the person that they're interested in finding out if there's a link, and that they have 25 people on the, on the, on the picture, on the set of photographs, and one person is a real TB case and the rest are all people who work at the health department or other people, and they try to just say, do you know any of the people on this picture? Have you spent time with any, any of the people on this picture? But we also are not allowed to do that in Maryland. So you really need to be careful about confidentiality and you have to work within your, um, your state confidentiality laws to make sure that uh, whatever you're doing is within uh, the state law. Wendy, can I can I uh, add uh, can I ask you something about that just to go along with that? Uh, again, we recently had a case uh, where we had uh, two patients who had a multi an extensively drug resistant uh, uh, form of tuberculosis, and one uh, when we went back and looked at the genotyping, the, the patients matched but had no epidemiologic uh, links that we could find whatsoever. Um, uh, one was a, a young. Um, uh, individual who had absolutely no links whatsoever. It was a purely, uh, it was truly a case of MDR TB, but none of the classic, um, uh, you know, risk factors. Never had TB before. Never traveled outside the United States. And they matched another patient who, interestingly enough, was also at the time a patient at AG Holly. Oh, not at the time, but uh, uh, about a year before. And actually, we went back to both patients because we had no idea, and we asked if it would be okay for them to meet. And both of them agreed that it was okay and that they waived their quote unquote confidentiality and we actually had the meet. I was wondering what you how you comment on that and <laughs> this way naturally you can yell and scream at us about that. But they both felt that it was important to try to figure out where the transmission came about and we also thought it was important because there may have been other individuals in that location that may have been exposed. A comment by you. <laughs> well, I think that's a really interesting approach. We have never even thought about doing that. Um, but for MDR, you know, if we ended up with an MDR cluster like that, we might because that's, that's a huge concern. Exactly. Um, this, was, this was a young kid who had absolutely no risk. And here's the bottom line. You want to hear it? We had the meet. They both were very agreeable. They sat and, and spoke for about an hour, an hour and a half, and still at the end of it, we could not figure out what the, the link was. I'd be very curious to know whether they were foreign-born. Well, actually, the, the, the first individual was, the second was not. It was a patient who was a, U, the young gentleman was a U.S. born, no respect, which I was going to bring up the second point, a question, if I may, and for either Lauren or Wendy, is do you ever, you know, one of the things that we found very helpful was to use the genotyping to try to, to, uh, to, try to track the geographic location of the strain. Interestingly enough, the strain that the young gentleman had was one that was very common in India which is where the first patient was from. So again, it didn't speak for a U.S. transmission. I was wondering how you guys ever use the genotyping to try to figure out, uh, you know, maybe potentially countries of origin. Lauren, that one's yours. <laughs> yeah, and um, so the TB um, complex can be divided up, of course, into the animal strains, and then um, there's four lineages of um, TB census stricto, and those are um, the Indo-Oceanic strains, which are prevalent along the rim of the Indian Ocean, um, the East African Indian strains, which are prevalent in East Africa and Northern India, um, and then East Asian, or commonly known as Beijing, which is very prevalent in Southeast Asia, and then up into Eastern Asia. And then finally, the Euro-American, which is, um, of course, very prevalent in the Americas, but also in Europe. And so um, we can assign um, our genotypes 
to these different lineages. And that does give us information. Um, it never proves anything, but it does, like you say, suggest that if a person has you know, a strain that we would call Indo-Oceanic Manila and is from um, another country such as somewhere in South America, you would have um, more of a heightened interest in um, questioning where that strain came from in that foreign-born person. Um, there was an MDR outbreak that I just love in that California identified two cases. And it was a strain that was prevalent in India again, but neither of these two patients were from India. They were both foreign-born, but not from India. And they did end up finding a source case outside of the state that was from India. So yeah, that information can be used very effectively. And it is somewhat provided in TB gyms with the genotyping data. We do um, indicate the lineage and then a sub-lineage such as um, Vietnam, India, Manila, to give you kind of an indication of where that genotype is prevalent. Lauren, Lauren first of all, I love your statement that you love that MDR case. I, you, I, I love that you two are a TB nerd like the rest of us. You know? <laughs> but the thing is, is, just out of interest, was that, out, that case outside California, was that from Florida? Because we still are trying to figure out where that link is, I'm joking. Um, what, so Lauren, what, I think you should check Georgia. Oh, really? Close <laughs> no, no, I'm just yeah. kidding. That's where Lauren is. <laughs> um, actually, Lauren, another question to you, to you and, and just a, ba I guess a, not a base question, but an instant question. What's the most common strain in the U.S.? I saw that question, so I quickly opened up my database to see what it might what, be, what, and it definitely. Huh? <laughs> so I was hoping you'd give me enough time to do it. Um, the most prevalent ones are members of the Beijing family. And some of the strains would be um, strain 210. If anybody's seen that one in the literature, that one has been circulating in the United States since the mid-90s when we first started doing genotyping. There's some strains that are um, very common in um, foreign-born patients. Um, so we believe that they are circulating and um, there's some genotypes, I guess I should say, that are very common in um, diverse foreign-born patients that we think are circulating overseas, and we are just not differentiating those genotypes into different strains. Um, and in the southeast, the most common genotypes are um, Euro-American X, which is the two-band family. Um, so some of you know about the two-band IS-6110 pattern that we couldn't do anything with for years. Um, those are still very prevalent strains in the southeast. Well, thank, thank you very, very much, Lauren. Hey, uh, just a quick, uh, before we go to the next question, but I have on my screen here, I have a couple people who are raising their hands on the computer, which I really appreciate. Um, if you guys would, pre if we would appreciate, if you guys want to ask a question live, just tell the, the operator on, uh, on Global Crossing, and uh, you know, and well, what do you call it? And uh, we, this way we can hear your voices, which is always much better. So. Can I ask the Global Crossings operator one more time to repeat how to ask a question live? Certainly. Ladies and gentlemen, to register a question over the phone, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone keypad. Thank you so much. We have a question in the EGALI audience. Hey, Dr. Jesus Ortiz, do you have a question? Uh, <clears throat> yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, good morning. Uh, as I'm listening to this lecture, uh, it stimulated some ideas. Uh, um, you know, when we talk about tuberculosis, uh, usually it's talking about uh, a particular strain with a particular patient, uh, a particular genotype. Um, but um, I'm just uh, thinking uh, in, in a scenario, for example, in a multicultural area where uh, people be uh, crowded and exposed, uh, let's say an immunocompromised individual, uh, <clears throat> if you have more than one strain um, exposed, exposure to that person, could they actually have two or, you know, theoretically more than two strains uh, of tuberculosis at the same, uh, in that same individual um, affected? Wendy or uh, Lauren, you want to answer that? Um, I, I can take that and Lauren, you can add to it. Um, the, the answer is, uh, 
certainly in countries where um, there's a lot of TB circulating, they have found multiple strains in a person. And in this country, even when they have cultured different sites from the same person, occasionally they have found a different strain. We still generally assume that the one we get first is the one they have. And um, so we, we, don't, we don't work from the assumption that that person has multiple strains, but I, it's definitely possible. And I think the higher the likelihood of exposure, the higher possibility that you might have more than one strain in, a, in the same person. And we can get hints of those multiple strains um, from the genotype. We end up with a pattern that we just don't expect. And that is usually indicated um, in your genotype comments that this is a mixed or possibly a mixed strain. Um, and then if people want to dig deeper, there are opportunities perhaps to do that. Thank you very, very much. I, I, I see here that I have a question from my boss, from Donna. So my job is on the line right now, so if I don't ask this, I'm in trouble. But she's, uh, she's, she's saying that she's very intrigued by the statement that uh, you're working on integrating questions about social settings into contact investigation interviews. And uh, obviously the field will be very interested in uh, seeing what, you're, you know, what is being developed. Uh, and she's curious about the length of time required by the lab to report out genotype uh, results. And is it, real, is it realistic to assume that one day we'll be able to integrate results into ongoing CIs? And actually, there's a couple different questions uh, that relate to the speed and how long it takes to do the Spligo and the Miro. And, uh, and I wonder if, uh, Lauren, maybe if you would comment on that. You know, I don't think it's so much the speed of doing the Spligo and the Miro as the fact that right now we genotype off of cultures. And so the routine is for labs to um, identify an isolate, um, a culture positive isolate that they need to perform drug testing on. And then they um, usually set up the midget drug testing procedures and then send the culture positive, um, positive control from the midget drug testing off to the genotyping lab so that they're always having a culture in their lab. So it's, that's really where your time comes in, because I would imagine that would be um, at a minimum four weeks. And um, right now, we just there's so much eukaryotic DNA in sputums that um, we really don't have a way to perform genotyping on those. And, and I'd like to um, add, we feel the same way that the turnaround time for us is has been pretty consistently uh, two weeks and sometimes less, but it does take a while to get those isolates out to the lab. Um, and, and we tend to batch them because of uh, just short, short staff numbers. Um, we try to, to move them fairly quickly, but um, there are delays due, due to that as well. But, but in terms of the actual contact investigation, um, there's always the issue of how long it takes for the secondary case to break down. So if you have a situation where I described the first case as being infectious for a long time and the secondary case as um, actually coming down with active disease before the first case is diagnosed, in that case, the genotyping and the time of the cases might occur around the same time as the contact investigation. But for example, um, in the case of the bronchoscopic ones, which, um, which, which David mentioned, so the first case had, it was, was bronchoscoped to be diagnosed, and then the second case was bronchoscoped, and it was seven months before she finally came down with active disease. People who get infected don't come down with active disease usually before three months. And so you've kind of got two things going on. The contact investigation wants to pick up the people with latent TB infection to prevent them ever getting disease. If you do have a contact who has active disease, then the genotyping might show that, yes, they do have the same pattern. But I see genotyping as helping contact investigations more by saying, wow, this contact investigation needs to expand. And, and I can give you an example of that. We had, um, it was very unusual. We had transmission in a store, a very small, very crowded store, and the cashier was highly infectious. 
and two, uh, two patrons of that store came down with the same pattern. Now, we would never have conducted a contact investigation in a store. We did conduct it among this cashier's coworkers, but we never would have thought to do it among the patrons. But when we got the genotyping results, um, this is one of those cases where you put a bunch of places on a list and then you have to see if they can pick out this one store where the cashier was. Um, we found out that those two patrons had been in that store. One of them had been there quite frequently. One had been there fairly rarely. And um, so we went back to the store and we actually got a list of other customers and tracked them down and did a full contact investigation on store patrons. So I think, I think that's um, maybe a more active way that, that genotyping can help contact investigations although it also can tell you that, yes, these two people that you identified as contacts do have the same pattern. I don't know if that's helpful. Thank you. Um, you know, the, we're, being, we're getting, you know, first of all, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, first of all, I'm getting a lot of comments, as you are, that uh, they really appreciate the practical implications. and. I think one of the big concerns I'm seeing in the questions uh, that is the length of time to get back to where we were before, you know. But in my experience, our experience here, um, if, and I, I would like to hear Lauren and uh, Wendy's comments, but uh, we've had experiences where we needed a result quicker, and we were able to call the labs, and they really have been able to help us out with essentially getting us results quicker, and uh, I think it's always important, you know, with communication between the labs. And I'm just wondering, uh, you know, again, uh, I, I think a lot of the, the trains coming back within the normal period of time of two to four weeks, I think, is very acceptable. But in certain cases where we needed a quicker result, I mean, the, the labs have been able to really expedite it, or at least try their best to expedite it. Lauren, do you agree with that, or, or when did you agree with that? Yeah, I'm thrilled that you said that. Um, the labs are always willing, um, as long as they are able, to triage different things for important reasons, and um, one of the most important ones is for um, false positive investigations where you really need a result quickly. And they can also um, provide interim reports. So um, spoligotyping is much faster than myriotyping. Our throughput is much quicker, so we often have that result first, but hold it until we have the complete MIRI VNTR result. Um, and so in a false positive investigation, um, a spoligotype may be all you need to make the conclusion that you need to make. Um, and then you'll get the additional information as it's available. So um, interacting with the labs um, as much as they are able is a wonderful thing to do. And if you ever have a question about a result, they can um, you know, look at the raw data and look for things that perhaps aren't um, immediately apparent. I totally agree. And, and two things that, you know, just to comment on that to just uh, follow up, uh, one is usually with the, cross, with the lab contaminations or cross contaminations, you know, or false positives, I'm very careful. Uh, how I play, how I uh, state these, because the lab gets very, very, very upset when we call them lab contaminations when they're really not the lab's fault, you know. But uh, the bottom line comes down to is that usually when we're dealing with a false positive, uh, you know, it's a little easier because they were working off of a uh, a culture. You know, usually we're dealing with two cultures that were positive. But to comment back on what you said, and I totally agree, is that, and I, I think we need to emphasize this, is that the spoligo results come out faster. But like you said, they're usually held. But in cases where we need the results faster, we can request a soligo with obviously the disclaimer that the results we're about to do may not be complete and there may, we may not, uh, the mirrors may be different, but at least if we, it gives the program at least the initial impression of how to proceed or wh where to proceed. Do you agree with that, Lauren? Definitely. Yeah. Um, you know, there, I got, we have a question here that uh, I'm, I think I understand, but it says, uh, I've heard that uh, there was an initial genotype into families first, and only fingerprinting done if it is requested by the state. Is this true? And I'm not 100%, I think what they're getting at is, uh, well, well, actually, Lauren, I'm going to let you try to, uh, what, what, do you have a comment on that? Or, um, first of all, sure, I, I, I guess, mm -hmm. I can go ahead and elaborate a little. So, yes, we do. Um, Spoligotyping and myriotyping, and present 
a, a very good picture of um, the genotype of that strain. Um, especially when we were only doing 12 loci, um, the genotype wasn't always discriminatory enough. We weren't always breaking it up into the different strains. Um, there were some very, very large clusters. Some of you may know that um, the strain PCR, or the genotype PCR type 2. Um, and so IS6110 was very effective in adding a different, um, additional information um, to that cluster. Um, now that we have the 24 loci, the role that IS6110 plays seems to be diminishing. Um, very few people actually request it. Um, and we do use the genotypes to assign to the lineages or the families that I mentioned above. So that would be kind of the top of the hierarchy. Then you would have the Spoligo and Miru. Um, and sometimes you may or may not have a need to add IS6110 to the picture. Um, as far as the number of requests for IS6110 nationally, I think it's less than 250 a year. So it, the, its place is definitely decreasing. And, and again, if I'm quick, Lauren, most of those requests, I believe, for the IS6110 is when we're trying to compare it to older strains where IS6110 was done only. Is that correct? That happens sometimes, yes. Okay. Thank you. And uh, we have another question here, and I, I think it's more related to Florida, so I can at least uh, begin to answer it and then please make comments. But uh, the question is, is, uh, is, is uh, genotyping being performed uh, for all cases, for all TB cases in Florida? And, uh, and, then, you know, and then they ask about how long does it uh, take to obtain the genotyping results. Just a, a, a quick comment on what we're doing here in Florida. We actually have assigned uh, one person in our lab, uh, Richard Doggart, who actually assures that every positive culture that we have in our Florida State Lab, as well as trying to acquire the cultures from the community and making sure we have at least one culture that's representative of every case, all of those then, Rich's job is to make sure that we send all those off to our regional, uh, our regional genotyping uh, lab, and then most importantly that the results come back and then get entered into our, our system. So the question is, is it being done on all cases in Florida? We're trying. Uh, I have to say to you, obviously, a couple of cases, the cases that are obviously culture negative or clinical cases, obviously there's no genotyping done. And I'd like to say that uh, we're able to get every culture for every case, but that's not always true. Sometimes the cultures are not viable or we have other issues, but we're trying. And um, maybe Wendy or Lauren, you want to comment on how other states are handling or is what I just said kind of um, – similar to what's going on in other states or other areas? Um, Lauren, I don't know if you have the, the answer to this, but I, I, know, I know nationally um, when I used to talk about genotyping, that nationally about 60% of national isolates on culture positive patients uh, were being received and genotyped by the regional labs, and now it's up to over 80%. Um, and Florida was one of the lowest. Florida was something like 22%, and yes, and and then thank every you year, that out. every year Florida has increased rapidly, and they're one of the high contributors now. Well, so, um, I do know that about Florida. Maryland has hit 100% for the last two years, and we've been always um, over 95% since we started in 1996. But but it does take work. Um, it's easy to get isolates from the state labs. But if your state lab doesn't have all the isolates, it takes a lot of work to get them from the commercial labs and the hospital labs. It just takes um, forming good relationships with those laboratories, communicating with them, identifying a contact person, and getting those people to send the isolates in. Um, and we also have, in Maryland, a state uh, code that says that one, one example of all culture-positive culture patients has to be submitted to our state lab, and our commercial labs are very quick about that now. That, that changed things a lot for us. It meant that they automatically submit to us anybody that has an address in Maryland, and, and that allowed us to collect those isolates better, and then our state lab submits all the isolates to the genotyping lab. 
And, uh, you know, Wendy, I really want to thank you for pointing out Florida's poor performance. We really do thank you publicly. I was trying to point out your incredibly improved performance. You're one of the high performers in the country. Well, actually, uh, two things, just in, in defense. A lot of work. Well, in defense, first of all, uh, w when we were doing our own genotyping, we may not have, let's say, been sharing that, which was a mistake, and we, we tried to correct that. Um, and now we're, now we're part of the regional just for our Florida uh, participants here. But uh, the second thing is, is that uh, we all believe that by putting one person in charge, which is Richard Doggett, if we continue to do poorly, we could just fire him, which was a much easier way to handle the whole situation. <laughs> so that, that, was, that was our solution to, uh, to that. Um, let, let me ask you, is he a laboratorian or is he a program person? He was actually an epidemic, I believe, and again, uh, I, I want to make sure that I got this right, and I may mess it up. Uh, hopefully, Rich is not listening. Um, but he was, uh, with our he was with our TB program and more on the clinical side, on the epidemiology, uh, and now is positioned in the lab as a, as a liaison between the lab and our TB program to make sure that we're getting, uh, you, know, every, you know, as best as we can to, you know, to make sure we're getting as much genotyping data as possible. That's great. There was one more caveat to the whole thing. Um, there, there were some microbiology issues, um, not quite getting the amount of sample to Michigan that um, needed to be done. And so Maria in Florida has worked with the Michigan lab to um, improve the um, capability of the isolates. And so even though it looked like they weren't submitting, it, it really turned out that um, there were lots of isolates with no results. Uh, I pre Maria has done a great job, and uh, I appreciate that very much, Lauren, and, and you're right. We had some other issues that were trying to, you know, obviously we all want, I think we, you know, one of the other things I think we should talk about is I think all of us in TB control want to develop this national database, and like you've pointed out, the more specimens, the more complete the database, the better off it is for all of us. And that was definitely our impression, and that was definitely our goal, and that's why we moved. And I want to, you know, thank the Bureau of TB, Jim Cobb, and then uh, Max for supporting that and making sure it got it, it got done. Um, we we have a question here uh, from somebody who has a very interesting uh, situation, and uh, they're asking, what do what do you, one of you think may be the explanation for a family of three sisters and one niece all diagnosed and on treatment at the same time with three different genotypes? Only two sisters had the same genotype. What, what would be your comment on that? Hmm. Yeah, that really, that really <laughs> it's kind of hard to comment. I mean, <laughs> you made me nervous here. I just lost my morning coffee just now. <laughs> you guys can't say, hmm. You know, it's always hard to comment on um, three different genotype results without seeing those genotype results. A lot of times people will say something with a dash in it is different when it, it's really not. And so without actually looking at the data and knowing um, the background, it, it's very hard to make any type of comment on that. Um, but we are always, you know, here at CDC, we're always um, interested to see that data and to discuss it with people. TV genotyping at cdc.gov. <laughs> I, I can add. Comment. Go ahead, Wendy. I, I can add a little bit to that. Um, so, so, so Lauren's point of looking to see whether uh, one spacer in the spolygotype or one locus in the Miru pattern is different could mean you're really working with the same bug and it's just hit one of its mutation periods at the time of transmission. So that could be one reason. Um, but Chris Braden, many years ago, uh, using RSLP was able to show that in families of foreign-born folks, um, two people could come down with the same, two people could come down with TB around the same time, and the patterns would be different 25 to 35 percent of the time in foreign-born families. And, and there's some evidence, which I, I don't want to get too far along with this, but I know Phil Hopewell has also mentioned it. Um, there's an enzyme in TB that seems to stimulate a latent organism to um, activate. So if one person has active TB, it appears there, there is something that is 
sent out that stimulates the other organism to activate, activate in another person. And I know there's some uh, research into this, trying to understand what's happening. And so it's possible that there's actually an explanation for several people in the same household having different organisms. Um, we've seen it in Maryland, and we're conducting one of the uh, TB epi studies task orders, and we'll be analyzing that data shortly. And one of the things we're looking at is people who are epi-linked have a close epi-link but a different genotype pattern, just to see where it happens and who, who it's happening with, and to understand how different that genotyping pattern is from the main cluster, and pa cluster pattern. I also think I also think something else. It, it also may tell you that this is a family that's obviously not very close and don't eat together or hang out, and they're just cat. They're very unlucky when it comes to TB. So maybe we're learning more about our genotyping and how and, and dysfunctional families or functional families, you know. Um, but I, I'm not so sure. But to kind of further what you were saying in a second ago, though, uh, we also use genotyping a lot, as you kind of alluded to, with reinfection versus reactivation, but. From a clinical standpoint, I think that has a lot uh, of, of clinical implications. Uh, I think you agree that uh, if you have somebody who just got reinfected, it tells you a lot more about the person's immunity, and you go clinically through a different algorithm that if this is a, re you know, a reactivation, it helps us clinically tell, like, uh, A, um, you know, did the person, obviously to review, did the person really take uh, their DOT? Uh, B, did they have issues with... Uh, with their drug levels, or C, you know, did they develop resistance? Um, um, so, uh, you know, we also use, you know, we kind of alluded it, and not quite in this case, but that whole issue of reinfection versus reactivation, I think clinically also has a, a very, very important role in how we're going to handle these cases. And um, I, I think, uh, again, uh, we, we always try to um, review that, you know. Um, I, we have another comment here, and I, I just, uh, I just, you know, it says, uh, the, any recommendations on two patients who are any ideas or, you know, what's your take on uh, two patients who are co-infected who are diagnosed five months apart with the same spoligotype? So, Laura, when do you want to comment on that scenario and what you think maybe what may have gone on? Wendy? Um, can you say the first part of that again? They were diagnosed yeah, five I, months apart. I apologize about that. It, it's two, it sounds like co-infected individuals. I take it two individuals who are probably infected with uh, HIV and TB who d were diagnosed with TB five months apart and they both yeah. have the same spoligotype. Well, you know, it, it, you know, from your pro point of view, you know, what, what do you think probably went on? It, uh, that's, that's where you get into that you need uh, shoe leather epidemiology. Um, I, first of all, I'd like to see more than the spoligotype. I'd like to see the, either the MIRU-24 or an RFLP because spoligotype by itself is not a very good uh, differentiator of clusters. And then the next thing would be to know, you know, the, 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 field, the field epi part would be were they in the same clinic, at the, the same HIV clinic at the same time, or were they around each other at the same time? Because as we know, uh, TB... If one person is um, infectious and a second person is exposed, five months could be a rational time that they would uh, break down with active disease after exposure. So um, I, I, think, I think the scenario could, could imply transmission, but it would be helpful to have more genotyping information because all of the typing is very sensitive and not specific. And also, it would be helpful to know whether they actually spend time together. I, you, you, so this, this gets to the point of really um, being able to do a, a more um, in-depth investigation to actually understand things. You can, you can guesstimate, but you can't actually say what happened without more information. I, I, I That's the fun you. part. I mean, it's, it's, it's not just fun. It's useful to programs. But, but it is... Um, it is detective work, and, and it's kind of interesting to get into these situations and understand what really did happen so that, for example, if you had transmission in an HIV clinic, what infection control practices are they carrying out, and do you need to intervene? And, and, and I think you'd agree. I mean, and I, this, this question actually and this comment actually goes to a, another question that uh, we've been seeing here in Florida. I was wondering what your, uh, your take has been that, when we're talking about uh, not just HIV, but immunosuppressed individuals, we're seeing more and more issues with our transplant patients. Uh, 
as we're seeing more senses in Florida do transplant, so getting more cases of TB, and genotyping becomes very, very important because the question always comes down to, was this a reactivation in a patient that was already infected with TB prior to transplant, or was this somebody who actually caught TB from the transplanted organs? And we've had a number of cases now where we're seeing TB being transmitted through uh, the, tra the actually transplanted tissue itself. So I was wondering uh, if uh, uh, Wendy or Lauren wanted to comment on that. Um, I know CDC has been involved in um, some investigations of that same type, and um, yes, it, it does occur, and I believe that um, there's a review of that either coming out or is already out um, to um, encourage um, doctors managing the treatment of these patients to um, use genotyping information, to use country of origin of information, to use um, genotype lineage information to try and figure out the puzzle. And I agree. And actually, uh, that question in some ways was a, a real uh, I have to admit it was kind of a teaser that uh, you are right, that uh, there is some information coming out and we're going to, uh, one of our future grand rounds is actually going to be about TB and transplants and the role of genotyping that you guys have done a great job of, uh, of really, I think, uh, making a very, very complex subject very, very understandable and very, very practical. And with that, what I'd really like to do is I'd like to thank Lauren Wendy, thank you so, so much for what I think was an outstanding presentation, and thank you very, very much for sharing your expertise. Um, we really appreciated it. Um, we've been getting a couple of questions about the, the slides. Will they be available? As you guys know, this Grand Rounds will be um, archived onto our site so that you can, um, uh, that you can listen to it and, and, uh, and enjoy it again, hopefully, in the future. Or if, if one of your colleagues missed it, please go to our website. And please uh, see the archive. As far, as far as the slides, I believe, again, if you go on to our website or send a question uh, or request uh, to, our, uh, to our webmaster, they will uh, provide you with the slides. Other than that, uh, I really want to thank everybody for joining us today. I want to remind all of you, please uh, go back and uh, fill out your CMEs and CEUs so you get credit for this great program. And I want to remind you about uh, some things that are coming up. Uh, for all you guys, uh, from September 12th to September 15th, we're having our comprehensive TB course here at AG Holly. Uh, we'd love you to join us. Hopefully there will be no hurricanes during that time. Um, if there is a hurricane, if, not, if any of you want to experience it firsthand, please come and join us. On <laughs> September uh, 16th, we'll be having uh, the TSC Train the Trainer. On September 29th to 30th, we have our TB program management course in Kentucky, and we're looking forward to seeing you all you guys in Kentucky. Our next Grand Round is going to be October 12th, and uh, it's actually our national Grand Rounds that will be broadcast, and we're going to have, uh, we have the, uh, the distinct pleasure of having uh, Elsa Villarino from the CDC join us and with some very, very exciting uh, news, and uh, what I think will be very, very relevant to all of us in TB Control, which is the, the, the uh, discussion of the three months of once-weekly rifapentine and INH for the treatment of LTBI. So that's going to be really, really exciting. And then on October 18th, as part of the uh, Southeast National TB Controls meeting in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, um, as long as they don't have an earthquake there, we'll be doing, uh, <laughs> we'll be doing LTBI revisit and new diagnosis and treatment guidelines. So we really uh, appreciate uh, seeing you soon. We appreciate you joining us. And other than that, uh, please uh, stay safe. And uh, for all you guys who are interested, at 1230, we'll be doing our uh, morbidity and mortality. And uh, for you who've, uh, who've already uh, registered, please just click on the link, and we'll be talking to you guys soon. For the rest of you, we hope to see you real soon. So from all of us at the SNCC, thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Lauren, for great, uh, 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 great presentations. And other than that, we'll see you guys real soon. Thank you very, very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.